Good. Um, before I... Okay, so two things. Um, first thing, I decided that open science is not part of the oral exam because that feels wrong. Um, so at one point I will run out of stuff uh, on EEG, as you see in the uh, layout uh, of the course and after the outline. And afterward, after that time, um, we can have the oral exam whenever it pleases you. So um, we come up with a date. So we can have it uh, in the break, we can have it in the term. We can have it immediately after the last session. We can have it two weeks apart. And I really don't mind. So uh, the the same boring four hours or three hours will happen to me. And when they happen, I don't really mind. There was a question. Uh, I was just asking. I was going to ask when are we going to finish with the EEG, but I'm still smart on the schedule. Uh, roughly around that time, maybe, so we will know a little bit closer to the end date when this actually will be, but roughly around that time. So I think the, there are around eight or nine sessions or so uh, with the EEG, and afterwards there will be open science. Uh, so yeah, come up with a date that you think is uh, best. Um, the other thing, because we are talking about random field theory in the other course, as you might have noticed, um, the, it's also used for EEG statistics and MEG statistics. Um, so we talk about it only in the context of um, fMRI, but um, it has been adapted and also applied to EEG and MEG since 2010 or so. So it also applies here. Good. That's just uh, two general points. Um, would the other exam have to be on a Monday as well? No. Can essentially be any day. Entschuldigung, ich wollte dann scheiße an als andere kommen. Hier ist ähm, steht gerade und dann noch die Nuss und hier auf der Karte 24. Ja. Weil es ist, weil jetzt zwei Angaben sind für diesen Raum. Okay. <lacht> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, come up with that date, uh, let everyone in and tell me next week. I don't want to uh, go into the discussion now. Um, Okay, so then let's continue um, with EEG, and we did a brief ride through EEG last time and talked about the outline of the course, and our first big block is uh, physical and biological underpinnings of EEG, and we started a little bit with that, so we started with um, electricity, we discussed that um, this section is based on these two books and um, then we basically went over the things the set of things that make up the part on electricity and i tried hard to motivate why we talk about these physics things um, using this slide because um, they are of immediate uh, meaning and applicability in the context of EEG data analysis. This is actually something, this is again a meta point, but you will find that everywhere in cognitive neuroimaging, that you're dealing with things that have their roots somewhere else, and it's always better to go to the roots. So cognitive neuroimaging somehow meanders through the world, but trying to not talk about the roots. And this just leads to so much confusion in the uh, whole field. This applies to the statistics stuff. Obviously, the stuff that we talked about with probability spaces today, you don't see that when you click SPM. But it is there. And it's always you get much more out of the whole cognitive neuroimaging thing if you also deal with the roots and uh, the basis of things where things are coming from. And 
if you're constantly confused by cognitive neuroimaging, the, I can tell you one. So the way you get out your own confusion is by looking at the basis of things. Then things things get so much clearer. And if if more people would do that, that would be good for the whole field. So this was the motivation also here. Um, and then we went over the definition of an electric charge. Um, no, and actually we went over these. Um, they're both definitions of things. And um, then start to concern a, a little bit more with actually um, the details of what an electric charge is. The electric charge being kind of the atom, if you want, if you use the word atom in this context uh, of um, the classical ideas of electricity. So the, the unit that you start from, that you base things on, is here um, the electrical charge. Um, like, for example, in mathematics, there are two atoms uh, that we base everything on. As you might have noticed today, these are sets and functions. So modern mathematics is trying to base everything that can be computed based on two concepts, namely sets and functions. And actually, you can base functions also in terms of sets. So everything is uh, trying to be based on sets. You could say, I don't like that. Let's base everything on, I don't know, operations. Then you would have a different mathematics. Here, um, we base everything on charge. You can also say, I don't like that. And people said, I don't like that. Um, um, let's base uh, things on other things, for example, strings, whatever that are. I don't know. Uh, but um, they then base things on other things. So these are just uh, kind of the foundational concepts. And in this case, it's the electric charge. So it also doesn't make sense in this setup to ask, but what is really an electric charge? In our context here, that's the basic uh, thing. Um, together with, uh, of course, forces. We talked about um, the meaning of an electrical field, something completely different from uh, a random field, just that you don't get confused. It's completely different. It's just the same word. Um, a football field is also something completely different, obviously. Um, so the electric field of a charge was um, the force vectors that it induces at each point in three-dimensional space, which is uh, shown here. So we talked about that and how it's measured. Hello. Um, and how um, it depends on actually how strong the original charge is that induces this electric field and a test charge, a second charge, um, so um, that is uh, put into the context of this electric field. And then, of course, how uh, far these uh, charges are apart and that then um, electric field is standardized in terms of um, um, the of, in terms of a unit test charge. And then we went over um, the idea of the electric potential, which in contrast to an electric field is a scalar field, which in this physics world means that to each point in 3D space, it allocates a scalar, so a single number. And um, then we also discussed that the electric potential is only always uh, um, defined with respect to um, two points so it's the potential um, uh, sorry so it's the work that needs to be done to get from one point of the electrical field to the other point of the electrical field and then of course it depends on where your reference point is which links to the notion of a reference electrode of course in the EEG um, and uh, we discussed uh, uh, or I said if you want to think about a potential in terms of, in terms of an thing that is uh, just uh, there. Once you have one electrical charge, then you uh, consider the work that you have to do if you move a test charge from infinity um, to that point in space. And then you can, then you have a, um, it's on that door where you have to go. You have to look at that door from the outside. There tells you where okay. the ideas are things. That was correct, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> The, um, the, so, so you need to work, need to do work by moving a charge from infinity to this uh, point in uh, space. 
then um, but of course you if you want this kind of absolute potential but then people actually do, um, there is actually an EG also if you read some EG papers by, by Nunes for example they then uh, uh, start with the question does these do these absolute potentials actually exist is that meaningful and of course experimentally it's not meaningful because you can only approximate infinity by something very far away so in, actually in real life you always have a potential between two points in space which will then be the active electrodes and the reference electrode. Um, so it's the work that needs to be done, that's the potential. Um, and yeah, there's some great stuff on here. One can formalize that uh, a lot further in, um, um, in the classical way of looking at, so in the theoretical physics, in the classical way of looking at theoretical physics from a mechanical perspective, you then uh, invent things like line integrals and so on, then you formalize things more and actually can compute this much more. We use this more like a conceptual thing, so I don't want you to compute uh, potentials, um, but we want to at least have kind of a notion that it's the work that needs to be done in an electrical field and used by a charge, um, and it's this work and, and um, that uh, needs to be done. And then we have um, again how uh, this is working. So you, um, there is now here um, shown an electrical field uh, by this uh, force vector. Um, that is induced by an electrical charge, and then the question is, how much do you have uh, to, how how much work do we need to uh, move a test charge along, um, for example, this uh, line? Of course, the things get much more interesting if everything is really in three D and you move the thing not just uh, along a straight line, um, but like on a curve or something. But then, of course, it gets also mathematically more tricky to describe now the curve and uh, how to then integrate over this curve. But that's what uh, theoretical uh, physics does um, intuitively of course if you um, if the field induced is very strong you have to do a lot of work against that then um, the potential um, um, to for, for a test charge to move from where you're moving it against to there uh, is um, larger if uh, if it's very easy then the potential is quite low um, and yeah it's of course always with respect to a given charge. Um, the important thing is uh, that um, the whole thing that you should get from this is that um, um, if you have um, assigned um, this absolute potential, then you can assign um, for two points in space um, the difference in potential, which then tells you how strong it is, uh, how, how much work you have to do to move from here to there. Yeah. So there are multiple. So they, one thing is that you have a reference. You, you establish where you need to put your reference. Uh, if you have um, the reference established, then um, you can then assign um, to each um, distance in um, space um, a potential difference that um, um, tells you how easy or hard it is to move a charge along uh, a specific line. And one can formalize this further, as I did here. So one can roughly view this as the gradient of the no, one can view it as the gradient of the potential scalar field. But I um, don't want to actually go with these these equations that you hear, see here. They are physics equations, so they don't make that much sense. Um, so don't go too deep into these equations. They are more. This, this is physics that tell, tries to tell you something with these equations. Like, oh, come look at the equation; it's clear. Um, and then, uh, so it's suggestive physics uh, math. So don't don't think too much about these equations. And the um, yeah. So the uh, essentially, um, it wants to say that. Um, a potential is something that you can that endure, that um, tells you um, how much you have to work against it to move something there, or if you look at it the other way around, how easy something flows from A to B um, if the potential is uh, there. The whole thing, and this is what you always keep in mind, this is the um, mechanical way of looking at electricity. And of course, it's inspired by um, water. Yeah? So the whole thing, one always thinks, is, so why is electricity? Why does it feel like if I have some water that I put here and I have a, like a, um, 
drainage or whatever, um, and then I have a potential from to water to flow from here to there. And so why why is that so parallel? Why is electricity behaving like water? That's crazy. The reason for that is that this whole theory of electricity is based on the mechanics of uh, water flowing. So, um, of course, there are other theories of electricity that uh, are more removed from this uh, intuition. Good. Electric potential. Um, next thing, electric current. Uh, are there questions about electric potential? It's measured in volt, if I haven't said that. Good. Electric current, uh, maybe less abstract uh, than electric potential and electrical fields. Actually, all the things that we talk about now are less abstract than electrical fields and electrical potentials. Electric current. Electric current is the movement of electric charge in a conductive medium in biological systems such as the human body. Current is carried by charged atomic particles such as sodium, potassium, or calcium, or chloride ions. So this is something that you know, that uh, currents flow in uh, biological systems and are carried by um, atomic, uh, by, by, by ions. And you also know that in uh, electrical currents in um, lines, in, in power lines, the electric currents are actually carried by the electrons and not some flowing ions. Um, so how can one define electric current? Um, well, if one... Um, uh, one, one way to define electric current is the following. The number of particles uh, of a specific volume, de volume density, so um, um, a density, um, of course, meaning a number of um, uh, um, um, coulombs um, per uh, volume, like a density, uh, uh, per, per unit volume, sorry, um, like a density is always defined, um, Passing through a uniform cross-section A measured in square meter of a conductive medium at a given reference per second. So what this means is, in, in school, you talked about um, current is measured in ampere, but one can actually be more specific. So one can say, okay, the current that I'm interested in is, um, if I look at a specific cross-section of a conductive medium and I um, define the number of uh, particles that pass this uh, section, at a given um, uh, overall density of um, um, particles, then I call this the electric current. So it's making uh, going a little bit more into um, um, the um, details of um, how to um, define current, because with this current is measured in amperes. If you actually have to compute what is the current in this conductive medium at this point, you have to uh, come up with a definition that is a little bit more specific. So um, what uh, this uh, little equation here says um, is that um, there is a charge drift velocity which um, describes how, um, um, the, how fast the charges drift. Then this rho says how many charges drift per um, unit volume. Um, in this medium, and um, then there is the question of over how much space do these things drift. Um, and this you can then call the um, current at a given uh, cross section. Of course, this depends on the conductivity of your medium. Yeah? So this is standardized with respect to um, the um, charge density um, and um, uh, charge drift velocity, but what these numbers, what these numbers take on this, of course, depends on um, how conductive your medium is. Yeah. And um, the, um, this charge drift velocity, um, again, can be, of course, uh, um, um, is not only influenced by cond how conductive the medium is, but also how much pressure there is for charges to move, right? And this is something you're also familiar with. If um, there is more pressure to move, so if there's a higher potential difference between the two sides of where the thing is moving, think again of uh, water running downhill or something, um, then um, things... Uh, there's, a, um, there's more pressures, uh, so um, the um, charge drift velocity um, is um, larger. So all of these uh, things are, of course, then functions of other things, um, and um, it de then depends on the physical surroundings of these charges, the charges themselves, and how much pressure uh, uh, there is for them to move. 
So that's uh, the whole thing is visualized here. So there's some kind of uh, charge density. There's a drift velocity depending on the um, on the um, uh, potential difference, which in turn de uh, in turn depends on, on the electric field um, um, that is there. And there's a certain area, and for this area, um, you can then define a current. Now, why do I talk about current? Mainly because I wanted to know what current density is. Um, because if you do source localization in EEG, you obtain values uh, from your source localization that tell you the current density for uh, this voxel um, is this and that. And um, the current density in this setting is um, the flow of electric current per unit area. So again, recall that a density is um, the mass per unit volume and um, here the current density that you actually see in EEG uh, sometimes when it comes to social localization is the current density um, per unit area. And this is how it's uh, then computed if A is the area. Um, and then it's just a function of the um, um, of course, the drift velocity and the um, charge density, it's not a function of area anymore. And it's measured in amperes per square meter. Yeah. This whole slide and the whole thing of me looking into it really derived from Loretta gives me the current density. And I know, yeah, I know what current is, but what is current density? So now I know, and now you know as well. Another uh, fundamental, any questions about current? No. We will see biological currents in uh, very, uh, once we are through the physics, then we will see actually electric currents in the brain. Um, next fundamental concept in uh, um, electricity, of course, resistance, um, which I think you played a lot with in school. Um, so resistance applies to electrical conductors. Um, so it's something that uh, refers to something physical. So you can have uh, uh, things that have higher resistance to electrical current, things that have less resistance to um, um, current. And uh, resistance is defined as um, the ratio between the potential that is applied to a um, um, conductor versus the current that you can then observe. Yeah. So this is how you can compute the resistance. This is not Ohm's law, some general knowledge which uh, might be helpful. So this is the definition of uh, resistance. Um, the important thing is that the resistance can change. And you know that um, from, for example, um, biological systems where you studied, when you studied action potentials, you know that in, in the resting state, the, uh, the membrane will have quite a high resistance to ions flowing. Once um, the um, uh, channels open, then it will have quite a low resistance to uh, things uh, flowing. So resistance is not a fixed property. Resistance changes. Um, and in electrical systems, you might also know that if things heat up, then the resistance uh, changes. But you can always uh, define such a dynamic resistance as um, the potential that is applied uh, versus the current that you observe. Yeah. So high, let's see whether I got it the right way around. So high potential, so high pressure, but very little current uh, means a high resistance, which makes sense. It's measured in ohms. Conductance is just the reciprocal, so um, higher resistance, lower conductance, and vice versa. It's measured in Siemens. Some product placement here. Um, yeah, then in uh, actually in um, EEG, people will always talk about the conductivity of um, the scalp or the conductivity of the uh, things between the brain and uh, the uh, place where you have the ele electrodes. And um, these are essentially um, very similar to um, conductance and uh, resistance, only that they are um, um, yeah, uh, computed with respect to um, a volume. So um, if one has a block uh, medium, then um, the resist, uh, resist 
resistivity is defined uh, with respect um, to um, the area of the block and the length of the block. Of course, this changes, and this is why um, um, if this changes for different objects. So this is why also the conductivity, for example, of a human uh, skull is not that easy to determine because it's not the block of a, a certain um, material of a kind of one specific material that uh, is very well studied, but it's of course uh, uh, biological tissue. So this is why um, people are always you know, trying to measure uh, conductivities. And um, then other people are worried about conductivities in terms of um, uh, source localization because um, they say, well, we don't know the conductivities, but we need the conductivities to do source localization. So how can we do source localization? Is it actually meaningful? And um, connectivity, um, yeah, this uh, this conductance that is expressed with respect to a certain uh, medium, which can be uh, or volumetric unit, which can be easy um, if it's a block. It can be very complex if it's not a block. For example, a human skull. Um, as a side note, uh, Ohm's law. Which always, which is easy to confuse with the definition of resistance, but um, Ohm's law says that um, um, potential is proportional to current, um, and the proportional constant being the uh, resistance. Uh, but yeah, but the resistance, uh, as we just discussed, can change, and hence Ohm's law often does not apply um, for biological uh, or, uh, or actually physical conductors. Uh, so just keep them separate. Resistance, the definition of resistance, and Ohm's law. Why are we talking about resistance? One thing is that uh, you should uh, be able to associate with something with the, with the term conductivity. The other thing that might at this point actually be more important is because impedance, the thing that you encounter once you partake in an EEG experiment or you actually apply an um, EEG cap yourself, um, is closely related to resistance. and. Um, luckily, maybe, or unluckily, so luckily because it's, we don't go deep into it, unluckily because it doesn't, will not really get really clear, uh, impedance is very close to resistance, but, and that's the bottom line, um, in the presence of time-varying uh, electrical currents. Yeah? So the resistance that you're familiar with, this always refers to the fact that you have an AC, um, oh, sorry, a, a direct current, not an AC, which is an alternating current, but a direct current. So the idea is current just flows, and then you talk about what is the uh, resistance of this um, medium to this uh, current, and you can talk about it. Um, and in actually a biological uh, systems and also in uh, the power systems that you get from, from uh, where you um, get your electricity from. Um, the current is not direct but alternating. So um, the, um, you know that already from the oscillations that you can observe on the skull. Of course, the potentials that you observe there, they alternate, meaning that um, if currents flow, also the, um, the currents alternate. So resistance um, is not the proper concept to um, discuss the resistivity, or not even the resistivity, but the, the thing against uh, uh, current um, so um, in the context of um, biological systems and actually also uh, power line systems but the, con uh, the concept of impedance is so the bottom line is that imp uh, impedance is um, um, is the quantity described the opposition that was the word that I was looking for the opposition of an electric conductor to the flow of current that periodically reverses its direction, um, so-called alternating current. So why is this um, um, interesting? Um, does anyone know why actually alternating current, uh, um, why one cannot just use the standard resistance in this case? No. Um, so the reason for that is that um, there's... Uh, um, one also there's also this thing of uh, capacitance so um, and um, um, 
inductance. So the thing is that um, if something flows in, the, the way I always imagine is, is so something flows in and then it takes a little bit of time um, until everything is filled and then the current runs. Yeah? So uh, like this is also when you look at uh, how um, membranes uh, uh, assume their potential. So there is this uh, uh, very uh, moment in time where the, basically the charge moves up um, or the current um, uh, uh, initiates and then it flows. So think of a, a machine where you, where you put on the thing and then the pressure is applied, but it takes a little bit of a lag to the whole thing get moving. And uh, you, very intuitively you can call this the capacitance. You might remember from school that you have these capacitors just these big plates and that you looked at charging a capacitor. Remember that? Some people remember that. Um, looked pretty 1950s to me when I saw that in the 90s uh, because there were these big plates and I was like, What's, what is this? Um, but these phenomena, they become, uh, because in alternating currents, you constantly charge something the one way and then the other way. So these uh, phenomena become much more important than in a dire current where things, this also happens, but only once and then uh, things uh, just flow. Um, so these two um, things that uh, show up in alternating, current, alternating currents, um, that add um, in a way to the resistance of the medium to current that is there in any case this uh, then gives rise to the notion of impedance and then if you look into physics books uh, then um, these impedances are described in complex uh, number forms because they want to do their oscillation this way and then uh, the, the whole uh, thing gets a little lost but uh, it doesn't help um, the um, um, depending on how, how the alternative occurring is, you can compute an impedance and the bottom line is and the answer that you should then should give if I ask you, so what is impedance? You should say, well, it's like resistance, but for alternating current, not uh, uh, direct currents. This is what I, this is my working knowledge of impedance because more it doesn't really help um, because the important thing is that you think in terms of resistance when people apply the electrodes you will also of course you want to make sure that uh, there is a good uh, connectivity between the uh, scalp and the electrode so one could also talk about resistances but these resistances are impedances because it's alternating current scenarios so we have to talk about impedances and uh, for very simple uh, um, alternating currents for example sinusoidal currents um, one can actually um, analytically determine what the um, two components of the um, uh, complex numbers are, which is also on the um, slide. Is there anything somebody wants to add for impedance? No? There's nobody who did uh, undergraduate uh, university level physics here, right? Is there anyone? Oh, you. And you don't want to add anything? Everything is fine. Good. Thank you. So I'm not completely misrepresenting your undergraduate physics. Yeah. I'm not completely misrepresenting the stuff. No. It's it's somehow like that what they okay. Good. Hmm? There was more mathematics, but yeah, but the concepts were, yeah. makes sense. Good. Um, so um, this is already um, basically our run through these uh, um, basic electricity terms. Of course, as you will uh, figure when you talk to people who did undergraduate physics, there is more one can do about them. There's more mathematics. Um, it's actually interesting. So if you want to learn more, ask your colleagues or ask Wikipedia. Um, yeah, but uh, try to associate something with these uh, very basic terms. Of course, it's hand wavy, but what can we do? Cannot always define the probability space like this morning. So we start with these hand wavy basics. Good. So any questions for the basic electricity part? Any comments? Good. So then we now can start with uh, neural origins. 
Do you want to start now with Neural Origins for 10 minutes, then have a break? Or do you want to now have a break and then after the break start with Neural Origins? Who wants to have a break now? No one. Everybody wants their break in 10 minutes. At this point, it's only like you don't care anymore. <laughs> it's, it's whatever. Whatever. Just finish the class. Good. Um, then uh, neural origins, um, the, which actually leads me to the question. Um, I, you are now uh, are taught by Adrian and uh, Julia in the other uh, classes, and um, they actually finally, or not, not them, uh, but they do something that should have happened in Scan for a long time. They use a book, uh, which is good, and. Um, they then split that. Are you doing the anatomy part of the book as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you discussed that also with Katya? No, she's not. We, we haven't had her yet. yet because she was in general. Um, I mean, let's do that off the record for. Um, so then you will um, see the stuff that we are now that you now see on the next couple of slides also in these courses. So we can be really brief. Um, so. This um, is, as you should uh, all know, this is the brain, uh, which um, comprises um, two things uh, in very um, brief terms, namely gray matter, where the cell bodies are, and white matter, where the accents of these cell bodies are. Um, and um, you will talk about this macroscopic details, which you should actually do in the first term. Um, and then you also know that um, maybe or, or even from last week's CCMB seminar that there are, that you can do histology on um, the brain, and this established these ideas of Boltzmann areas. But there are different areas. You also know that. And where I want to get to is actually this typical. Um, view of the cortex of having multiple layers. Of course, this is always only true in certain parts of the cortex. So it's kind of an abstraction to say there are these uh, different parts uh, or these different layers because in different parts of the cortex, these layers look uh, different. But what we need for to, to um, be able to talk about the EEG origins, I need to briefly remind you that um, there are, there's the standard model of the uh, uh, cortex, which comprises um, six um, layers. And uh, these uh, six layers um, contain uh, different uh, cells and have different uh, names. So here you see kind of this uh, Golgi staining of a, um, a cortex. So here down there you have the white matter, this is the cortex. And in Golgi stain you see cell bodies of some cells, uh, and it's not really clear how this uh, Golgi stain really works, but um, at least you can see something. And um, then, for example, you see that in uh, layer five, you have the uh, bodies of um, the pyramidal cells. So why, this is why this is called the internal pyramidal cell layer. Maybe I should zoom in a little bit. Um, and uh, then you have um, these pyramidal cells extending their uh, um, apical dendrites uh, towards the um, top of the um, 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 cortical layers. So then you have this external pyramidal cell layer. And um, then you have other layers that where you have, uh, for example, this granule cell layer where you have the so-called granule cells. Um, this looks different if you uh, um, stain that differently. For example, Nissel stain, which uh, primarily stains the cell bodies, or Weigart stain, which cells the exon, uh, or dendrites and exons mainly. Um, these kind of cortical um, um, setups, you might think at this point, uh, with EEG, this is finally removed from EEG, so these things don't really matter. There is actually some, or maybe let's even, let's even say a lot of work that's trying to build EEG models that are quite close to these kind of descriptions. And actually, I have also contributed to that literature uh, with one paper um, so far, but this is also something that I'm very interested in. Um, so where it's actually where we actually try to come up with biophysical models for these um, yeah canonical um, 
um, layouts of cortex that then get uh, translated into EG signals that we can measure and based on these measurements then infer on these cortical layouts. So I think this is from my neural uh, science uh, genes, this is really what I want to do in cognitive neuroscience. This is also why I think EG is much cooler than uh, fmi because you can actually do something like that and people don't tell you you're crazy if you do something like that in fmi you can also do it i mean it's no, not that you cannot do it and that i wouldn't say it's sensible but the bad other people will say ah, you shouldn't do that fmi is so far from uh, neurons you should not do it you should show us blobs so um you will find these things actually in EEG papers, and of course, this is also why I'm bringing them up. Um, there is um, this very um, basic model that you also find in, in the Candel book, and so this is obviously from the Candel book. Um, I think that might not be a reference on this slide. That uh, is uh, based on the idea that um, in uh, layer four, you get uh, the uh, afferent um, uh, accents. Um, that um, come from um, um, somewhere and um, then the layer 5 neurons which are the pyramidal cells they provide the output so um, here um, there is this uh, there's this anatomical um, um, nomenclature of how these uh, fibers um, are called. So the basic idea is that the input comes in in layer 4 from the thalamus, so external uh, uh, input, and then each region, um, the pyramidal cells actually um, um, project outward from layer 5. This is, of course, this is an idealization and not completely true and so on, but um, oops, sorry, but um, is uh, yeah, kind of the standard model. Um, and um, the if one looks a little bit closer the question is where do these uh, things uh, come from um no, sorry where is other things going to why is there it says layer four no ah yeah no this, well, well, now i'm confused let me check what i'm doing uh descending from yeah so this makes more sense for me at this point. So um, the um, layer five uh, pyramidal cells, they um, are um, cortical-cortical feedback connections. This is the typical uh, story about um, pyramidal cell neurons and prediction errors. Um, so they provide uh, feedback. Um, of prediction errors to lower areas and um, superficial layers pri uh, provide in uh, cortical cortical so inside the cortex um, input to higher level areas and they there's some layer specificity specificity so you will find if you look into the whole literature on what is called the free energy principle slash predictive coding, um, you will find that they always base everything on this kind of layer specific uh, feedback and uh, feed forward stuff. In EG, this this whole uh, this whole um, rhetoric about predictive coding and so on, and testing this with EEG has never happened. So. Uh, let them talk uh, and keep in the back of your head that you actually would like to test this with EG and then uh, you actually need to build models and think more about the details. For the course, this is, um, as you see with me struggling with it, it's not essential. The, more, the most important thing is that um, you get from um, the uh, course that um, there are pyramidal cell neurons, they extend over multiple layers of the cortex and they are quite large and they get input they can get input from various sources as we will see and um, they um, then will be the basis for the eeg signal so let's have a break now um, and um, then focus uh, on the pyramidal neuron so what i try to in this first section of the biological part is to zoom in starting with the brain 
I'm talking about the cortex, talking a little bit about connectivity in the cortex, but now dealing with the primary, uh, primary cell type that we are interested in um, for the generation of the EG, which is the pyramidal neuron. So let's have a break now.